Hello and good afternoon. I have Jason with me today. Hi, Jason. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. My name is Jason Rakulik. I'm the author of um, a new book called Hidden Pictures. It's a supernatural thriller slash mystery. Uh, also written a book called The Impossible Fortress that was a lot less popular. It came out five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did you always know that you wanted to write? Uh, I think I was, uh, I was always writing, like from a young age. I mean, like you, you hear this all the time from writers. They were, you know, making books at like age five and their parents were helping them put it together. Like that's, I totally have a story like that all through school, uh, making my own comic books and things like that. So um, I don't think I ever imagined that I could be a writer, like as an occupation, that just seems sort of, way out of reach that seemed like saying you know you wanted to be president or, or an astronaut but i was always uh interested in stories and storytelling definitely weirdly um a couple of times i've asked that question especially guys have said no my wife dared me and <laughs> then they've written a book i don't know what it is but oh, <laughs> it genuinely wow. has been the case <laughs> nope, no, no, that was not that was not my experience. Um, I didn't do it on a dare. I just always, uh, I don't know. It was the one thing that, you know, well, the, the other thing was like, I, I just was not particularly good at anything else. Like I was not an athlete. Um, I didn't really have a lot of other skills. So, um, and uh, so, you know, by default, I was like, well, <laughs> here's, here's, here's one thing that, um, uh, you know, I seem to have a, a knack for it and an interest in it. So um, I remember, you know, any time a teacher read something I wrote in class to the other students, like if it got picked as like the model, like, boy, that was the most exciting thing for me. I, I tried to keep that inside, you know, but, but it really, um, I remember wanting to have that feeling again, <laughs> you know, so. And I'd, you know, I'd say out of probably 90% of people that have gone on to become writers, I think it, it starts there at school with teachers praising their writing. I don't yeah. think, um, you know, perhaps some teachers realise quite what an impact that has. Um, yeah. But I hear that an awful lot, you know, so that obviously really sticks, which is lovely. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, again, thinking about like not being good at anything else, I remember when you would see like, other things written by your classmates where like you know there were some kids in my grade who still could not even put together a sentence so like in my mind I was like okay I may not be able to catch a football or <laughs> you know hit a baseball but I do know how to do this um and so I wanted to do more of it so what made you sit down and decide okay today's the day today's the day I'm gonna go for it I'm gonna write my first novel Oh, well, I mean, you know, that moment happened 18 or 19, no, when I was 18 or 19 years old, 30 years ago. Um, so I remember being interested in writing and sort of approaching it as a hobby, you know. Um, but then I remember being in college, and I wish I had this book because I don't know the title of it or who wrote it, but I found it in the library. It was one of these How to Be a Writer books. And the person said, this is going to take you so long. You're going to have to work so hard at this and work so much at it that if you do not start right now and approach it diligently every day as a goal, you're never going to do it. It's too big of a mountain to climb unless you actually are, you know, really applying yourself, not in a casual way, but seriously, you just need to, it's a, it's a big thing. And I, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember exactly. I wish I had the book because I remember the moment thinking, oh my God, he's right. I need to get home and get to a desk right away and start. And, um, and you know, I wrote, so, you know, and then like, I, I, I've had a number of jobs, <laughs> you know, and, and, but I always made time at, uh, at night or early in the morning to write for like an hour or two a day. And 
I wrote a number of like bad unpublished novels that, you know, sort of accumulated dust under my bed. A lot of books, they weren't, I mean, they were bad because um, it took me a while to figure out that I really need to outline. Um, some people don't and some people do. And I clearly do because I probably started four or five novels about an outline and then, you know, they, they just sort of all fell apart and they were all sort of broken. Um, it took me about 10 years to learn that. Um, and, um, you know, one of the jobs I had, I, I sort of gravitated toward publishing because I was like, well, at least I can like be in the orbit of other writers. Um, and again, I didn't really have any other skills. So like I, you know, I figured, well, I'll work as an editor. I can work with other writers. Um, but I wasn't really in mainstream publishing. I was working for like an indie press in Philly um, called Quirk Books. And, um, and that was a great job because I had to sell a lot of books. I was the publisher. So like I was constantly going and presenting books to the sales department. And I learned a lot about what a book needs to succeed and how books are sold. And all the while, again, I was like writing at night, um, late at night, early in the morning. Um, Ghostwriting. Uh, I did I did some books there under pseudonyms, um, a lot of rewriting. Sometimes, you know, main group would come in and it's an absolute mess and you, the editor, need to fix it. Um, and then at, oof, let's see, five years ago, I sold my first novel, um, The Impossible Fortress. And, um, and it did okay. I mean, it was sort of well received, but, but nobody really bought it. Um, and then uh, my second book, which just came out in May, um, is probably a more commercial book with like a grabbier hook and um, definitely much more popular. So um, yeah, <laughs> no. So that, that's that's a brief history of my my thirty years of trying to make this happen. <laughs> Yeah, suddenly you're everywhere. You're just, I just keep seeing your name and this book everywhere. So that's usually a good sign yep. um, that you've done all right, especially in the UK. Are you surprised by how well received it's been in the UK? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I've not heard from my UK editor. So I kind of wondered how it was doing in the UK. I, I Sometimes I see Instagram posts with the UK cover. So I know, you know, some people are sharing it, but I couldn't get a real sense of how it was performing. So you think it's doing okay? <laughs> there was, I guess, just after its release, it was everywhere. So, yeah, yeah. that's a good Oh, time. great. All right. So you're doing all right. It's all good. <laughs> and you're here. So, you know, if some weirdo from the UK wants to interview you, then you must be doing all right. <laughs> well, you're actually the second person. I talked to a guy named Neil McRobert. He has a podcast called Talking Scared. Okay. Um, He's also in the UK, so that was a fun one. Damn it. <sighs> I have, to, <laughs> I have to go seek him out. <laughs> That's cool, though, especially, um, you know, getting worldwide, um, you know, exposure is awesome. That's what all authors want, isn't it? So yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so um, do you have, from both of your books you've written, um, or should I say, who was the most fun character that you wrote and who was the most difficult? Oh, boy. Um, well, I'll just talk about Hidden Pictures because, again, I think it's just a better-known book. I mean, um, there's a character in Hidden Pictures. His name is Russell, and he's, um, he's Mallory's sponsor. Um, he's sort of this gruff older guy who's, you know, a secret softy on the inside. He's, he's got the sort of gruff, no nonsense exterior and he's very jaded and he's seen it all. But um, he is, um, well, I don't want to spoil anything for you because you're so early in the book, but he's, um, he's pretty consistent as a character and he only wants the best for Mallory. And so, I don't know, I just sort of, He's not in the book all that much, but I, I always loved it every time he turned up. I loved writing his character. Um, and um, I don't know who the hardest character was. I don't know that any of them were all that difficult. Um, a lot of them were really fun. So I, I don't know that I had a, a, a hardest character. Did you have to do a lot of research? And what was the most fun thing you found out while doing research? 
Um, I did some research. Um, Mallory, my protagonist, is someone who is in recovery. She's had a problem with oxycontin, oxycodone, and um, and you know that's a it's a big problem here. In, well, it's a problem everywhere, and it's a big problem here in Philly, um, which is what sort of got me interested in it. And um, I have a family member who works with or who worked with people in recovery. Um, so I had some good conversations with her um, about how that all how, how that works, and some other friends who um, been in that realm, so to speak. Uh, so that was probably the only real research I did. I mean, the other thing I did with the book actually, um, and nobody I think knows this happens, but the book has a lot of references, uh, secret subtle references to fairy tales. And I tried to write a lot of scenes that parallel scenes in famous fairy tales because the book is about a child and fairy tales are like horror stories for children. So I actually did a fair amount of research into fairy tales to find out if um, the big reveal in my book is ever uh, used in like a Grimm's fairy tale. And you, I don't want to spoil it because you haven't, you haven't read the book. Uh, and I'm not sure if your listeners well, I've read the book, but um, but that was a question I wanted to figure out for myself. You know, is 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 there a version of the story like in a fairy tale? Um, I shall see when I get to the end. Then yeah. I shall I shall message you and go. You'll know what I mean <laughs> when you get to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so apart from the fairy tale references, did you hide any other more um, like Easter eggs or secret jokes or um, anything in there? No, I don't think so. Um, no, the big thing for me w w were the fairy tales. And again, I would tell you the specifics, but I don't want to spoil the book for you because um, you're only six chapters in. But, <laughs> um, but you know, one, once I realized, I mean, it's funny, it sort of happened organically. Like it, once I realized I was sort of alluding to a couple fairy tales and it was happening naturally, I was like, oh, I want to do more of this. And I want to try to name check every fairy tale I can think of. So I'm pretty sure I got them all in there. Um, <laughs> awesome. That's so. pretty impressive. <laughs> so. um, I totally forgot what I was just going to ask you then. I've gone complete blank. Um, Leslie Lloyd um, wants to know what the day job is. She always loves to know that. <laughs> oh, well, my day job was... Um, I had worked as an editor for a long time and then ultimately as a publisher of, of an independent press in Philly called Quirk Books. Um, it was a little press of like 25 people, still exist, I'm just no longer the publisher. Um, and it was great. Like we, um, the, the best thing about that job was um, we had pretty modest budgets for everything. So I discovered a lot of uh, young talented writers like that was where we found writers because we couldn't afford to bid against you know Simon and Schuster or Harper Collins we, we could never compete with you know their their million dollar advances so what uh, my job was was just sort of looking all over for people who were talented and trying to sort of find like a commercial vehicle for their talents um, and sometimes the first book wasn't the right one but but I, you know, if I found somebody who, who could write, I would sort of stick with them until like we got one, you know? So, um, you know, like uh, there's this guy, Ransom Riggs, and his first book with us didn't really do anything, but his second book was Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, which was like a big blockbuster YA franchise. Right now it's like six or seven or eight books, um, millions and millions of copies. Um, and, um, you know, when I started working with him, he was just, I think his occupation was blogger, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> and, uh, Grady Hendrix is another one. He's a really popular horror writer. Um, I, um, I can't claim to, to, to have discovered him, but because he existed before I met, you know, before I met him, but like he, he <laughs> was you know, maybe he was a self-published writer, but I feel like we did his first uh, novel, which was Horror Store. And then 
My Best Friend's Exorcism, which uh, is actually just been adapted into a film that's coming out next month. Um, and uh, and then he's done like, you know, four or five books since then. All, uh, you know, the, the new ones are all New York Times bestsellers. Um, so that was really super fun. I mean, it was really gratifying to like meet these people um, at the dawn of their careers and then see them actually have careers. Um, there are probably half a dozen people like that. And I miss it. I, I love it. Um, but at some point I realized that I was never going to write anything of my own if I was doing that job all day because the job was just all consuming. It was just day and night and it was very hard to find time to write um, after sort of using those same muscles all day to like work on all these other manuscripts. Um, so I, I got to a certain point where I was like, all right, I'm just gonna go out on my own and, and try to make this work. So. Yeah, that must be really cool though, to, to be part of the journey of them people and stuff. Yeah, it is, it's really great. Um, and I miss it and I kind of wish I could do both. I wish I had like enough hours in the day where I could do both because um, I miss that job a lot. And, uh, but such is life. Yeah, don't, yeah, literally not enough hours in the day. <laughs> I know, I, I, I do lots as well. And having to work for a living is really annoying because I want to read and do other stuff. And I yeah. just can't, <laughs> I just can't do it all. Very annoying. Yeah, if someone would pay me to just read, that would be great. But so far, no one's offering. <laughs> yeah, never mind. Um, how do you pick your character names? Oh, gosh, I struggle with it. I, I don't know that I'm very good at it. I feel like if I had a weakness, I'm, I think I'm bad with names. I wish I was better. Um, I do what a lot of people do. I look at, you know, baby name books. Um, I always want to know the meaning of the names before I assign them just to make sure like I'm not doing something weird. Um, there's a lot of readers will will say, oh, well, this name means such and such. And I'm like, oh, boy, I better make sure that like, um, you know, I, I, uh, I want to make sure that the meaning of the name actually does sync up with how I see their character. Um, but, um, but honestly, if I could, if I could choose one thing about myself to improve, I wish I was better at choosing character names. I don't, I, I, I don't know. There's some writers who are just so good at it and they just seem to do it effortlessly. I mean, there's so many great names in like the Harry Potter series. Like there's so many names in that series that are just <laughs> incredible, you know? Like she clearly has no trouble with it. Um, well, you say that, but you don't know how many hours she agonized over those oh, names. Oh, that's true, that's true. <laughs> That's true, but there's so many, I feel like she must be good at it. Um, and there are just so many really good, like memorable names, like you just, um, so uh, you, really, I would say you hit upon my weakness. <laughs> That's what I think is my biggest weakness. I don't know, I might have a bigger one, but I'm not aware. Well, <laughs> talk about weaknesses, no, I'm joking. Um, when you're, um, editing what's your most overused word or phrase um, hmm. I don't know that I have one I mean or if I have one I, I don't I'm not aware of what it is um one thing I do at the end of writing a book is I tend to take out a lot of he said Mallory said Russell said, I, I tend to go in and take all of those. I, I, I try to take out as many as I can because, you know, I feel like I put them in as I'm writing the book because I'm just trying to like get the story down. But then you realize everything's going to read a lot faster without them. It's just, you know, it's just these little tiny things that they're like microsecond interruptions to the text that the reader doesn't need. The reader knows exactly who's speaking. You can take it out. And I am the sort of person who loves to go through the book with a fine tooth comb and take out every single possible word I can so that all that's left is what I feel is essential. Um, so, um, so my books always tend to run, I think they tend to run short, you know? I mean, Hidden Pictures is about 87,000 words, which is not short, that's sort of like a normal length for a novel, but I think it, I hear from people who tell me they've read it in like 24 hours or, or 48 hours. And um, 
I think it's partly because I took out Mallory said and he said and she said. Yeah. And, well, plus it's just really easy to read. Like I've started, I've literally been reading it. I've done an hour or so and I've got to chapter six because I'm just yeah. like, I'm reading it on my phone. So <laughs> when I go do something, I'm taking my phone with me as well. So yeah, <laughs> right. I, will, I will have finished it by tonight, I think. <laughs> but I have you. <laughs> well, I'm loving it so far, so unless it yeah. really goes badly wrong after chapter six, then <laughs> I think you'll be fine. Um, if you were able to spend a day with any author, dead or alive, who would you like to spend a day with? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Any author, dead or alive? Well. I'll say I'll say Roald Dahl um, just because I would have a lot of questions I'd want to ask him about um, a lot of his short stories. I know, you know, he's sort of remembered, everybody loves his kids books, but I think, I don't know if people remember his adult, his stories for adults as well. Like they were really popular in the 50s and 60s. They were all published here in the New Yorker magazine. And I love these short stories. They're always about like these spouses conspiring to murder each other. Um, they always had great twist endings, like Twilight Zone kinds of twist endings. There's always like a twist in the tail. Um, and just really sort of like, sometimes they were really mean spirited and dark, but really funny, super, super funny. He seems like he has like a really, great dark sense of humor and um and I fell in love with all those stories at a really young age like so I've read them now like dozens and dozens of times um you know stories like man from the south um and uh so I mean I probably would I, I'm sure I would have like dozens of questions that I'd want to ask him um I don't know if he'd be good company um <laughs> I don't know what he's like <laughs> I mean, you, I've heard mixed things, but um, yeah, but that's who I would go. Awesome. Do you know what? I think that's the first time anyone's ever said that, which surprises me a little bit because he is such a legend. Yeah. But, you know, for his children's books and onwards. I'm re yeah, and I can't think of anyone else that's ever ever said that. So, but yeah, I love Ralph Dahl as well. So yeah. Um, have you made? I mean, I guess you kept author friends from your job, but have you made new friends since you became a writer? Um, not, well, you know, I mean, the thing is like my, my transition to this career sort of overlapped with COVID. So as soon as I did it, we went right into lockdown, which um, is partially why I ended up writing a book with illustrations because um, I knew the illustrators and I knew that if I could work with them on a project, I, I would probably go a little less stir crazy. I'd have friends to talk to um, while I was in my house waiting out uh, the virus. So, um, so, and, and now, you know, things have opened up and, you know, things are, I feel like mostly back to normal where I live. Um, and, uh, I've met a few writers. I would not say I've made any new friends yet, but I hope to, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, again, I do feel like I'm still just coming out of like the pandemic, even though it's probably been like six months now or eight months since I've really <laughs> worried about it. Um, but it's like, I'm remembering how to like be social again. <laughs> and, um, you know, I have a couple of events coming up where, uh, you know, like book fairs and things like that, where I'm hoping other writers will be there because I would love to to you know meet meet some people and share stories and and doing interviews like this have been really fun for me too. I've met I probably met more readers than writers um, or booksellers. Um, I've done some really fun uh, book club meetings and you know virtual book club zooms and things like that and virtual uh, bookstore events. So, so those have been a lot of fun, but I can't drop any good names. I, I can't tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm buddies <laughs> with, uh, um, I don't know, no, no, no headline names to share. 
I met um Kathy Rikes and Tess Gerritsen this year. Oh, nice! That's great. Yeah, just a just a randomly name drop, but that's because I go uh-huh. to book festivals, <laughs> and they came to the UK. Otherwise, I'd never have had a chance. But yeah, yeah. So, would you consider coming? Because we've got well, we've got one. The Harrogate um, International Crime Festival is huge. So, would you mm-hmm. ever consider coming over for any of those sorts of things? Absolutely. I mean, I would come. I mean, if 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 my UK publisher invited me, I would be there in a heartbeat. I would. I, I say no to, you know, I'm I'm a very dutiful writer. If someone asks me to do something, I will do it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I've been to events with three people, you know, so I'm sure, you know, by, by comparison, this one would be amazing. Uh, yeah, Haruga is unbelievable and... Yeah. Um, um, and it is international. We get Swedish and Icelandic and, you know, American writers and stuff. So um, I think probably Cassie, uh, we had, who do we have? Michael Connolly this year and someone oh, else. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, so it's incredible. Yeah. So, yeah, he should come. Now, is that what you mostly read? Do you mostly read crime or what, what, what's your favourite, what's your genre of choice? It is crime and... Um, as a result of reading crime and Cassie Reichs, I ended up doing a forensic science degree. So oh, wow, that's, that's cool. it's really influenced my life. Which um, so yeah. Now is that does that is that your day job too? Or what are, you, are you a how do you, how do you use it or? No, so well, I only um, graduated in March this year. Um, I was a okay. mature student, so um, yeah, just trying to find a job now in that area, okay. but which is yeah. quite difficult. But yeah. Huh. Oh, wow, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, I know. It's just crazy how reading and and also um, during a pandemic, I started doing this, which is not mm-hmm. something I could ever expected to do because I hate seeing my face on screen. Um, and yet I've done over 300 and I love it. So, yeah, it's just really changed everything. It's crazy, but but awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah. And keeps me out of mischief, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is that your genre to read as well, if you ever get a chance to read? Uh, no, I mean, I read all the time. I, I like I like crime. I like I like thrillers. I like some horror, not all of it. Sometimes it's a little too much for me. Um, and um, but I, I don't know, I, I have pretty broad pace. I'll read nonfiction, um, science, history, biographies. I like books about movies. I love, that's like probably my favorite, like guilty pleasure vacation read. I love like making of the movie stories, you know, um, where someone does like a deep dive into Chinatown or something like that. Like I love those kinds of books. Um, um, so yeah, I, but but I mean, I, I think my go-to is like suspense, like suspense. If I had to pick, if I had to pick one thing, and that's why I sort of wrote hidden pictures. I was like, all right, if I'm gonna, you know, publishing sort of demands that you specialize in something, and so you might as well do something that you like to read a lot because you got to keep keep up the speed with what everyone's doing. So, um, so that's how I ended up in suspense. If you were to switch places with a character in any of the books that you've read, who would you choose? Which book would you choose? Any of the books that I've read? Yeah. Oh boy. Um. Hmm. Um. No, no pressure. I'll just put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, boy. Um. Oh. Oh. Oh, there's a great book called I don't know if you've ever read the storied life of AJ Fickrey by Gabrielle Zevin it's about a bookseller uh on this island in like a sort of tourist town and um I just love the world of that book I forget what the I forget what island it's set on but this is this is idyllic little bookshop in this tourist town populated by like these you know wonderful characters and I, I could trade places with any of those people and like live in the world of that book I've read that book three or four or five times um and I just sort of love the world of it and the spirit of it and the way the people in the book talk to each other so you know, I could take any other places I think I'd be happy yeah that sounds awesome um yeah she has a new book out 
this summer um, called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, which is pretty popular here in the United States. I don't know about overseas. Um, probably more popular than the AJ Fickery book, but the AJ Fickery book, which came out like 10 years ago, is still really, really good. I guess you don't get much of our British fiction over there anyway, do you? You've got enough. Oh, of sure we do. Oh, sure, no, we do. I mean, um, Anthony Horowitz is really popular over here, like Magpie Murders and, you know, the, the Sentence is Death, The Word is Murder, um, all, all those books, that whole series, um, super popular. And I read all those. He's great. I don't know how he writes some, he's so prolific. Um, so, and, you know, and a lot, I mean, they're all pretty, um, I don't know. I feel like I'm constantly picking up books that I just is, I'm like, oh, this must be an American author. And then I look at the jacket. And I'm like, oh, no, this is actually was not first published here. This is first published in, in, in the UK. Um, and we're bringing it over. So. Yeah, well, that's cool. That's kind of nice to know, actually. <laughs> yeah, particularly with thrillers and mystery and suspense. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, the, the crime fiction thing here is huge, absolutely yeah. massive, as proved by Harrogate, actually. I think this year they had the record numbers. I, I think I heard they sold 70,000 tickets. I'm not sure if that was right, but I don't wow. know if it was 7,000. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was crazy. So, yeah, uh, yeah, crime fiction here is massive. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about the British people, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you're able to travel to any period of time, either forwards or backwards, where would you go? Oh boy, you got some stumpers. Uh, I did warn oh. you. <laughs> I always I warn people. Wanna, I don't want to go forward. Um, I'd probably go to. Oh boy. Maybe New York City, maybe New York City after World War II. I don't know. That might be a mistake. Uh, 1950s, maybe. I don't know. Um, I I guess the reason why I'm, I'm thinking about that is because I would be curious to see what publishing was like before TV came along. Um, having worked as an independent publisher, you know, one of the challenges of publishing is um, that we always struggled with is that we were always competing with everything for people's leisure hours and leisure dollars, right? And so as a publisher, I felt like our books were not just competing with other books. We weren't just competing with HarperCollins, but we were competing with Xbox, we were competing with Netflix and podcasts and movies and TV and, Pandora and you know when you when you think back to like to the time just before TV got really widespread and you realize just how the world was just much more like literate <laughs> and people read many 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 more books um the best example I can give to, to illustrate this is um my books were, when I worked at Quirk Books, our books were sold by Penguin Random House, which is you know the largest publisher in the United States. And when you go to their offices, the rooms, uh, the conference rooms are named after legendary Penguin Random House authors. And, um, and the biggest rooms go to the biggest authors. So, you know, the Truman Capote room um, is a fairly small conference room. You know, you can probably fit like six or eight people in there for like a small meeting. Uh, the Dr. Seuss room is much bigger. Um, that's like that's like a conference room you could probably get like forty or fifty people in. But the largest room, um, like the auditorium where they have the big meetings that you could fit like three hundred people in. And if you ask people to guess who is that room named after, no one ever guessed this. Uh, and the answer is Louis L'Amour, who was a popular Western writer. Uh, here in the United States, wrote a lot of Westerns, not a popular genre probably uh, where, where you are, but here, and you know, insanely popular, um, particularly in like 1950s, so popular that he had over a hundred books that sold 
more than a million copies each. So like, you, you know, you, you, there's nothing, you can't even like fathom that nowadays. You know what I mean? Like imagine being an author who had a hundred books and that each of those hundred books sold more than a million copies. People were buying books like crazy before TV. Um, even the worst books, even the, 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 like the most garbage book full of like misspellings and typos and just like the pulpiest trash, you could probably move like 50,000 units, no problem. Um, so um, also the other thing that I, I would like to see is the, um, the magazines that publish short fiction that aren't really around anymore. You know, you used to be able to make your living, Roll Dahl made a lot of money selling short stories. Um, there were writers who like sort of spent their whole career writing short fiction. Um, none of those outlets are around anymore. They're all gone. Um, so for all the problems of 1950s New York, um, and I'm sure there were many, uh, I would be excited to just sort of be in like the, the literary culture of that time to see all that stuff at play. So I'd, I'd love to know what the uh, what the experience was as well. Actually, yeah, it sounds fascinating. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting to me. I kind of geeked out there a little bit, but, but I, I'm amazed I came up with an answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair play. I'm impressed. I'm a little bit cruel. I do like putting people on the spot, but usually people come up with something. Very rarely they don't. So no. <laughs> um, seeing as you're already involved in the literary world, was there anything? when you actually started writing that you found harder than you expected? Um, and what have you most enjoyed since you started actually writing yourself? Um, no, I mean, there was nothing, with this particular book, there was nothing that, um, once I had my sort of outline, which took about three months um, to figure out, then writing it was not, I don't remember any particular like challenge um i feel like the big challenge is getting to the outline you know like that that's always tough like the project i'm working on right now i just i keep turning it around and around in my head because i feel like there's something wrong with it like at a foundational level and i shouldn't i shouldn't waste time writing like 100 pages because i'm i know i'm going to throw them away and there's something there's something wrong in the setup and after we get off this call i'm going to again like just bang my head on the desk trying to figure out what it is um and boy i wish i could figure out how to work more efficiently um but uh i don't know everybody's got their own methods and this is mine and i'm stuck with it <laughs> <laughs> and how do you find uh marketing i know a lot of authors hate it uh yeah i don't mind it um it's i mean you know if you mean like doing interviews like this. Um, it's fun. I love talking to booksellers in particular. Booksellers are great because first of all, they always know what's good. You know, you can always get like a good recommendation from a bookseller, librarians too. Um, <laughs> it's fun talking to other writers um, and it's fun talking to readers to get their perspective. You know, um, I just did a book club in a, a little town in New Jersey called Point Pleasant and uh, it is really, it's really fun to hear people's reactions to, to something you've written. You know, that's super enjoyable. So um, anytime I can talk about you know, my book or someone else's book, you know, I'm happy. So yeah, I could do this. Okay, more left field question then. Who is your first celebrity crush? First celebrity crush? Um, oh. I don't know. I don't know that I had one. Uh, I remember when I saw, you probably don't remember this movie. Did you ever see a movie called Tipsy with Dustin Hoffman from like 1982? I've heard of it, but no, I've never yeah. seen it. <laughs> Jessica Lang is in that movie. And I remember seeing it when I was probably 12. And I just thought she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. You know, I just thought she was absolutely gorgeous. Um, so <laughs> I guess it was probably her, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> great actress and really good in that movie. I mean, the movie's just so good. I think it holds up. So. 
Not um, a crime movie, though, so. No, nah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, where's the strangest or funniest place you've ever woken up? Oh, um, I don't know that I have a good answer to that one. Some people don't. Uh, yeah, Depends on how, say... how drunk you got in your younger years and whether yeah, you can nope. actually remember. <laughs> Nope, I wasn't getting drunk. I was trying to write books, and um, I didn't party too much. I was I was at my desk at night, uh, living this monastic, boring life, and I would just wake up in my sad apartment. <laughs> um, so and look where it's yeah. led you. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, if you were to become ruler of a country, what's the first law that you'd introduce? Oh, hmm. Uh, oh boy. Um, gosh. <laughs> but does this happen like when you ask these questions, do people's minds just go completely blank? Like, has anyone ever. Totally Why do you think smoked? I do it? I've got to have a little bit of fun myself. <laughs> um, I like watching you all squirm, it's fun. I don't know. I guess I would. Mm, oh, trying to think of laws I'd want to get rid of. I don't want to say anything too controversial. <laughs> <laughs> yes, both of our countries are rather politically. Uh... That's the thing. You have to be really <laughs> careful nowadays. I don't want to say anything that's political because I. I I, I, I'm not interested in making a political statement, um, but you're talking about passing laws. So I guess I will mandate um, free licorice on the first day of the month because I like licorice. I see. I'm not coming to your country then. Ugh. Oh. <laughs> I see. I'm out. Taste. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose if it's free, I could give it to someone else. That's fine. Okay. But then I'll just have shed loads of free licorice, but you know, each to their own. If you could give somebody else free on like the 15th, then we can swap, then that'd be fab. <laughs> okay. My ice cream, maybe ice cream would be good. Oh, okay. Free ice cream. That sounds good. Okay. Great. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> okay. I will stop asking you either questions now. And unless you can think of anything that I haven't asked you that you think I should have or that you want to tell us, then I don't have any more questions for you. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't. Um... I, I don't have any uh, don't have anything I, I'd like you to ask me, but I, I hope you'll enjoy reading the book. Um, I hope you like the I hope you like the story. Um, and... Yeah, expect a, a message in maybe like six hours or so. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> All right. I literally I'm just gonna sit and read it until I finish it now. So. <laughs> Yeah. I've got to be up early for work. That's ah, fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Minor details. Um, so would you like to tell everyone where they can get it from if they would so like and if they can um if they want to find out more about you? Sure, it's at bookstores everywhere, I hope. Um wherever wherever fine mm -hmm. books are sold. Um and uh I'm on Instagram at Jason Rakulik. It's J A S O N R E K U L A K. If you search hidden pictures on Instagram, it'll come up real fast. Um, and uh, and I have a very sort of rudimentary website. <laughs> Some information. <laughs> it's also just my name dot com. So uh, I don't do Twitter. I don't do TikTok. Uh, but I, I do try to stay active on Instagram because you, know, you have to pick a platform, and that's the easiest one to use in my opinion. <laughs> brilliant well thank you very much it's been lots of fun <laughs> all right thanks so much for having me it's a real pleasure